it's always a privilege to be with the beloved, and uh, I count today uh, as an extra special blessing. Uh, Patrick Conrad has trusted me to bring forth the word today, uh, and that's truly an honor, and I appreciate uh, you giving me your time for a few moments this morning. Um, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, this was one of the first verses I learned after becoming a Christian, and it was one of the most impactful verses. Uh, a pastor that uh, discipled me some uh, brought this text to me and said, Aaron, this would be a valuable text for you in life. It reads this, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. And the reason why this text was so meaningful to me when I was younger was this reason. There's a couple things that are revealed in this text. The first thing is this, is that there are some things that we will never know. There's some things that God chooses to not put plainly in front of us. And that's okay, because he can do that, because he's God. He has the right to do that, right? Amen. But there's also another glorious truth here. God, in his graciousness, has chosen to reveal to us some things that are incredibly beneficial for us. The things that we need to know, he has revealed to us. And these truths are recorded in Scripture, and they serve as anchors for our souls. And we need those at times. See, over and over in the Scripture, one of the anchors that I see that's very clearly stated in the Scripture is that suffering is never pointless. And so if we were able to start with the first slide today, uh, today's sermon is called this, The Glory of God in Suffering. And you see this over and over in Scripture. If you think about it, and I'm just going to jog your memory for a moment, from the story of Job to the whole nation of Israel, all of their experiences, uh, you can go to the New Testament, to the man born blind. You can go to any of, uh, there's a collection of other stories that I can mention. But it's abundantly clear in Scripture that suffering is going to be part of the follower of Christ's life. And also, here's another thing that's revealed. Over and over in Scripture, suffering is intertwined with the glory of God being revealed. It seems like, according to Scripture, that as we endure difficulties in this life, we have the opportunity to show forth God's glory with an intensity that comfort could never afford. So today, we're going to look at one such account in the Scripture. Uh, we're going to be in John 11. If you've got your own Bibles, I'll have many of the Scriptures on the slides but we're going to look at the first part of the story of Lazarus and his resurrection. And what my hope is today for us as a body, because we're in the midst of a very difficult season right now, is that I help us have some anchors today through the Word of God that we see it maybe in a different light, the suffering that we're currently going through, that we appreciate it for the fullness that it could bring about in this body. I know as I was preparing this last week, it did for my own heart. So let's dive right in. If you would, let's stand in honor of reading God's word, if that's okay. We'll be reading John 11, 1 through 10. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. The village, Lazarus of Bethany, the village Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, The illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he had heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Let's pray together. God, I ask you today uh, to keep the focus upon you today, Christ. That, Lord, today, um, when we walk out of this room, we'll have some anchors for the most difficult moments in life. And, Lord, the things that you've revealed in your text, make them plain today. In the name of Jesus Christ, all God's people said? Amen. 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 Feel free to grab a seat. And we'll just go back and go through the text uh, verse by verse here. 
John 11, 1 through 3 reads this. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And the first thing I want you to note about this text is that the Lord did what to Lazarus? Loved him. And he was ill. You know, it it, it may shock us today in our current American culture, but God loves people and sometimes people also who he loves get sick. You know, uh, there's this ideal floating around, particularly in Christianity in America, that goes like this, that we kind of sell forth a Christ and say, if you come to Christ, all the problems in your life will go away. (laughs) That if you come and, you know, you're feeling bad, you got a bad marriage issue, they say, come here, it'll make everything better. Well, Scripture says that's a lie. And precedent says that's a lie in the lives of believers that I know and I've walked with. The Lord both loved Lazarus and also Lazarus was ill. You know, see, the problem with these lies that are currently spreading on this in America is you get this kind of imposter version of Christianity. And and the results of that really are horrific. You end up with somebody who gets sick, and then kind of the sleuths or the detectives start looking at what sin could be in their life that made them sick. Or maybe it's their lack of faith. Where's Ken at? Hogwash, right? I mean, it's the worst of the worst, I would say. Here's what I know for sure from Scripture, okay? And beloved, take this as an anchor for your soul. This is point number one. Those who follow Christ will suffer. God loves Lazarus, but he is suffering. If you love the Lord, there will be times that you also suffer. Augustine wrote this. God has one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. One more time. God has one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. And we need to remember something about Lazarus' suffering and our suffering in our text. This is verses 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Well, see, the problem is, if you know much about Scripture... Does Lazarus die? So maybe Jesus misspoke? I hope not, right? (laughs) Then we'd have a lot more problems today than that then. Here's what I think Jesus means. If you could view it as like an interstate, there's going to be an exit where Lazarus dies, okay? That's exit four maybe. But exit eight is the glory of God is going to be shown, and that's the destination, There's going to be some bumps in the middle. We were driving out of Sanford the other night, and we hit a pothole, and I thought our car was going to flip over. (laughs) It was incredible. That wasn't our destination, right? It wasn't going to lead us to the pothole. We didn't stop there. The death for Lazarus was not the end. It was the step towards the end, and the destination was going to be God's glory. Point number two is this. Suffering has the ultimate end of glorifying God. See, by glorifying God, I want to kind of define what that means. It means that we hold him with more reverence. We behold the value more clearly of God. We love him more because we have a deeper appreciation for who he is and his works. See, it's not like we add something to God as if he needs something from us, right? It's like this. That the telescope is turned just a little bit, and all of a sudden we see it focus in now. And we appreciate his beauty more clearly. That's what it means by this, that suffering is going to produce the glory of God. It's that we're going to be able to see God as more magnificent than we walked into the room. Amen? Amen? And that is what Lazarus' death is going to do. It's going to have the ultimate end of glorifying God. You know, we see the same thing. I mentioned this just passing in the introduction But in John 9, verses 1 through 3, we read this. They passed a man blind from birth, verse 2. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This is the same thing in America, right? Who sinned? It has to be this man or his parents that he was born blind. Jesus replies, hogwash. (laughs) 
Sorry, my translation's off a little bit, sorry. He says, it was not this man that sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, suffering has the ultimate end of glorifying God. We see this over and over and over in Scripture. This should not be a foreign concept to us as followers of Christ. We read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 this. So we do not lose heart, though the outward self is wasting away. Amen. Amen. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen. Amen. And see, at moments like we are in right now as a church, we got to be careful because look at this first verse. It says, be careful not to lose heart. You see that? And that is so easy to happen. And I think that's one of the things we're in danger of right now as a body is you have to be careful. We have to remember to fight for some truths in the midst of difficulties, right? See, here's the truth of this though. And this is why we have to fight for it. Because sure, there'll be some that see the glory of God in this life through restoration of health, right? There's some that will see that. In those, it's kind of somewhat easy to glorify God, right? There's some that will only see faint glimpses of healing in this life and glory in this life. And you'll endure all this life and hardly see anything. And then I believe that there's others that will see no healing in this life. But they have to cling by faith to understand that there is a glory, a weight of glory prepared for you that you will behold when you delight it. If you'll be delighted when you enter eternity. Amen? Amen. And see, the weight of suffering can almost become unbearable unless we're holding on to biblical truth that God is doing these things for our good and his glory. We're not just a product of a happenstance or bad luck that God is working out some plans in here that are maybe beyond what we could even understand. And we hold grasping to the fact that our suffering is working ultimately to bring God glory and it's going to produce an eternal weight of glory in our own lives. And see, this is the plan for Lazarus. As we read on, though, I want you to maybe notice something kind of unique here in verse 5 of chapter 11 of John. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. I mean, imagine for me for a second, okay? Uh, I'll go Lynn and Brent over here, okay? Lynn calls Brent and says, I'm sick. And Brent says, okay, I'll be there in two days. (laughs) And he stays two days longer where he was at. She might be happy about that. (laughs) you're going to stay away from me two more days that might be a good thing (laughs) Jesus is a little different than Brent amen you want him there when you're sick but he chooses to wait two days do you find that odd I mean when I read it I did you know um, I I wrote down here I want God's will in my life but I find it a lot harder to say I want God's will in my life in his timing I read this week that God's never late, but he's rarely when we'd prefer him to be on time, right? So the question for us is still this, why did he wait two more days? And I want you to track with me because this is so foreign to our concept of thinking that I've got to kind of build in here a little bit. Um, If you love somebody, which does he love Lazarus? Yes. Yes, okay. So if you love somebody, you want to do what's best for them, right? Right? Okay, so we're still tracking together. Would it be better for Lazarus to be healed prior to suffering and dying? Or would it be better for them and for us in exchange to see the glory of God in a more magnificent way? Yeah. I mean, what is more valuable, right? The glory of God or physical health? Now, see, that one's somewhat easier because I'm not sitting there suffering, right? It's kind of easier for us to go, yeah, that's, that's that, obviously the glory of God's more important. Let me ask you this one, kind of to turn the lens a little bit. Um, would it be better for me to get some debilitating 
horrible disease, cancer, etc., and die a suffering death, all the while learning to love and depend upon God in more of a complete way versus living a happy, peaceful, middle-class life and dying old surrounded by friends and family. See, that makes it more personal, doesn't it? See, Jesus waited two days because he loved him. And when he loves somebody, you'll do what's best for them. And point number three is this, that we should value the glory of God above earthly comfort. To experience and know God is our greatest good. This should be our ultimate desire. And suffering functions for the Christian to wean us off satisfaction in this world and to turn those affections towards Christ more completely. And I do understand this is a foreign concept in one sense sometimes because predominantly in our culture, we do everything for our individual comfort, right? I mean, we... You can even say that some in the Christian American versions of it have created this idol God that does everything for your comfort and for your good in this life, right? And that your life now is supreme. Well, see, God doesn't operate like that. And those are just charlatans, right, would be the word we could use for them. They are not representing the God of Scripture at all. See, God values his glory above all things else. Do we, as a beloved, as a body, value his glory above all other things? I wanted to give us a couple examples from Scripture so I can kind of bring forth the ideal that God's glory and knowledge of who he is should be supreme in all things. And so I've got two examples of this. Uh, The first one's going to be from Exodus 32, and we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 29. And in this story, Moses is coming down from the mountain, Exodus 32, 25. Um, and the people have broken loose. Aaron has let them do that. <laughs> no relation. <laughs> Don't worry, Pastor Conrad, we are still okay, all right? <laughs> uh, enjoy your vacation, okay? <laughs> but here's what happens. Picking up in verse 25. And when Moses saw the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose, to the derision of their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come with me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he saw them. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companions and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each of you at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. You are now ordained. What a service, eh? See, what these people did is they saw people of God were presenting an incorrect image of who God is by their sinfulness, their looseness. And these sons of Levi saw God's glory worth more than the most intimate members in their family. You see that, right? The cost of your sons and your family members. Now hear me clearly, okay? I'm not asking you to take out your sword this morning and start wielding people around you, okay? Um, But what I'm asking you this, are you willing to hold to Scripture and confront maybe even your most loved family members that are in sin? Do you value the glory of God that much? Or do we just turn a blind eye to his sin? These people cared about the glory of God. Amen? Amen. 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 It's very clear. Another example we're going to look at is in Numbers 25. If you want to turn to your Scripture, we'll be picking up in verse 6. Numbers 25 Verse 6. I'll give you guys a moment to get there. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family 
in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. And, Moses, and the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, behold, I will give him a covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and, and his descendants after him the covenant of perpetual peace priesthood, because he was jealous for the for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Again, another strong passage, right? But the man was committing sin and, and all other people are weeping. Oh, how could this be going on? And Phineas says, it will not go on any longer. It will stop today. He raises his spear. Now again, listen, I'm not asking you to spear somebody next week, okay? Uh, but what I'm asking is, do we value the glory of God enough to act on it? Yeah. To preserve the glory of God. And these people saw the glory of God with great worth, supreme worth. And in our passage, um, we see this, that Jesus chose to wait two days longer because he loved him and he wanted the glory of God to be shown in a more magnificent way. Later on, if you skip down in John 11 to verse 40, Jesus said to her, Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Verse 43, uh, skip a couple there. When, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man that died came out. See, one writer I read this week said he had to be careful to say Lazarus because if he wasn't careful, there was enough power in his words to raise every person that has ever been raised dead. So he had to make sure he said the right name. See, Jesus waited two days longer because the glory of God would be more clearly seen by raising a dead man versus healing a sick man. The suffering that Lazarus experienced in the midst of that it's totally worth it if you have a Christ-centered economy. If you do the calculation from that sense. I mean, you think about the guy born blind from birth. I've never been born blind, okay? But years suffering, being dependent upon everyone else all of your life. Think about that. I don't know how bad that would have been. We know that he's pretty much at a beggar stage at this point, right? all for the fact that God could show his power on the side of the road one day and it's 100% worth it. Amen. Every minute of suffering was totally worth it. If we see the glory of God as ultimate, right? Amen. I mean, I want you to think about this practically, the story of Lazarus with me for a second. The family's grieving what would have happened. The community would have came together, right? They would have came to love the, the family. Jesus knows what he's doing. Uh, he knows that when he gets there, there's going to be a crowd, right? That's why you wait two days longer. Now, listen, Jesus knows the plan. God knows the plans in your life. But guess what? The disciples didn't know the plan, right? We'll see that from our next text. And guess what? Sometimes we will not be privy to all the things God is doing, right? That's, right. That's the way it works. And so sometimes we may sound like the disciples, right? This is verse 7 in John 11. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Whoa, Jesus. Are you serious? They're going to try to kill you again. We just left that. You know, you can imagine they were in obviously a hostile situation, thought he might get stoned. Uh, now they're away. They're kind of getting a few moments of reprieve, right? 
kind of coming down if you've ever been in those tense situations. If you're a police officer, I know you guys have been there. Um, and now he's like, let's go back over there and try that again. <laughs> You know, it's funny, uh, if you jump down, uh, and I've got it on the screen, uh, verse 16. So Thomas called the twin, said to the fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. (laughs) Uh, You guys remember Eeyore? Let's just go and die, okay. (laughs) That's what I feel like. It's like Eeyore, let's just go ahead and do it. Um, Don't be like that when you're suffering, Christians, please. A pastor, Daryl, who was a former pastor of this church, wrote on Facebook yesterday, God places us exactly where he wants us to be with his purpose in mind. We have to learn not to complain. Amen. One more time. God places us exactly where he wants us to be with his purpose in mind. We have to learn not to complain. Whew. I think if he can say that, we should say that. Amen. Amen. You know what he's been through the last few months. It is clear that disciples are aware of the journey and aware that it could have consequences. But here's something they need to remember and what we need to remember. The glory of God is worth more than our lives. I mean, this is the call of the Christian gospel, right? I mean, take up your cross and follow me. Why do you have a cross? Because you're going to suffer. It may end in your death. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Is that what they say? <laughs> That's true. He does. It may be brutal. It may be incredibly harsh. If I was preaching this to the Afghan brothers this morning, they would understand it. Amen? Amen. Maybe we're in too much comfort, right? God has a wonderful plan of your life. You might even say it's your best life now. You know, we're not masochistic. And I want to be clear about that. I think it was Oswald Chambers I I read this week. He wrote, no healthy Christian would ever kind of choose to to hurt themselves or suffer. We choose God's will, as Jesus did, whether or not that means we suffer or not. Amen. Amen. So here's how Jesus comforts his disciples. In verse 9, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus tells them, as you walk through this life, walk with me, stay in the light. If you're with me, you will not stumble. He uses the same language over in John 9, verses 4 and 5. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And that's what he's saying here. I'm the light of the world. Follow me. Jesus is telling his disciples, do not fear. You're going to face fearful circumstances, but if you're walking with me, you're in the light. Amen? Amen. Stay in the light. Do the works that I've called you to. The last point of the day, Some of you guys are excited. You might beat the Episcopalians out today, right? Man, we're way early. (laughs) Sorry, Pastor Conrad. Keep them as long. (laughs) As we walk with the Lord, he will direct our paths. Every single one of our paths. Beloved, I want to hit a reset in our hearts real quick, okay? We need to seek first the kingdom of God, right? And his righteousness And all these things will be added to our lives. See, it's amazing when you hold God as supreme worth in your life, how many things now begin to align. I mean, listen, have we forgot that every resource that we need to follow after him will be provided to do the will that he's called us to do? That's right. I mean, listen, every ounce of health we need He will provide to fulfill his will for our lives, right? Every breath that we need will be provided for us to do the will for our lives. And I would just plead with you for a moment this morning, beloved. Don't give in to the fearful game that is being paraded in front of us on TVs all across America and on phones. I mean, listen to me, beloved. Please don't divide over inferior matters like vaccines and things like this. You have liberty. If you want a vaccine, get one. If you don't, don't. 
But then to divide as a beloved body over that is foolishness. Christ died to unite us. Let us not divide over silly matters like this. Christ died to unite us into a holy army marching through this ground. And listen, even though it may not feel like this, we are standing on much firmer ground than we may believe today. If we are standing upon Christ. I mean, imagine with me for a second. If you could hear Christ interceding for you today. Whoo! The courage that would rise up in this body to do forth his will. But we may not hear it, but beloved, it is going on right now before the throne of God. I mean, maybe it's this, that we possibly have forgotten that our salvation, which was brought forth by God doing a work of his will, is also the same God that's working to sustain our faith. Right? Maybe we've forgotten that. And maybe we've forgotten this. We have a promise in Scripture that the work he began, he will bring it to completion. Amen? Amen. And listen, when you have no strength, he will be your strength. And here's the thing. He won't fail you because you are a work meant to show forth his glory. And so it's his character that he's sustaining you with. Amen? Amen? It is his reputation, which he will never leave us out alone as orphans. Amen? He will meet us. And if you are suffering today, listen to me. Christ will come right up beside you. And he'll show you the marks in his hands and remind you that you are not alone today. He understands what it was like to suffer and that there is an eternal weight of glory beyond what you can even imagine waiting right beyond your last breath possibly. But it is waiting. Shine forth his glory, beloved. Amen. Amen. We'll end with this. Look to Jesus as Hebrews 2, 12, 2. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Look to him, not your circumstances, not anything else that would creep into the way. And I want to take just a moment in application. There's five points today. If you didn't, want to fill, if you didn't get a chance to fill them in, here's your chance. But I just kind of want to walk through these. And um, we're going to put a little silence between each one to let you just kind of think and, and pray on that for a moment. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Point number one from the text was this. Those who follow Christ will suffer. Take a moment and just pause and think upon that. Point number two was this. Suffering has the ultimate end of glorifying God. God asks you to move through your spirit and work in our hearts. Point number three was this. We should value the glory of God above earthly comforts. Point number four was this, God's glory is worth more than our lives. And lastly, as we walk with the Lord, he will direct our paths. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us live lives with passion. And the ultimate desire is to be lives that shout out to God be the glory. Amen? Amen.